Hello everybody. In this video we're going to take a look at how we can create an underwater scene with some fake caustics. So let's go ahead and get started. Uh, first of all, let's just talk a little bit about what I mean by caustics. So I'm going to open up two images. We have uh, this image, which we're going to initially use to uh, fake some caustic effects in Maya. And I also have this underwater uh, image of a swimming pool. And you can see the caustics in here. You can see the lighting effects that are on the pool floor. So that's more or less what we're going to try to uh, create in Maya. So let's go ahead and get started. So the first thing I'm going to do is create a ground plane. That's going to be the beginning of our terrain for this scene. Go ahead and make it larger and I will increase the subdivision so that I can create some interesting rolling terrain for this example. I'm also going to create a camera I like to uh, create a camera that I'll render from. That way I can use my perspective camera as a working camera later on. And I'm going to just call this my camera. And I'm going to go over to my top viewport panel and I'm going to select my camera so that I'm looking through it and I'll start positioning it. Now, because as artists we have control of the camera and can really compose our scenes, I'm going to go to my render settings and I'm going to select what will be its image size. Uh, later on I'll be rendering a uh, video. So I'm going to choose HD 720 for this example. Uh, and while I'm at it, I'll go ahead and switch over to the Maya software render for this example. That'll make rendering easier and quicker. And I'm going to go to the Maya software tab and I'm going to change quality from custom to production quality. Later on we'll return to the render settings when uh, we get ready to render out a video. But for the time being, that should suffice. Now, because I've set the um, ratio for our composition here, uh, and this is the window right here, my camera, this is the camera that we're looking through that I just created, I'm going to click on this button here, which will show us the borders of my render. This is very important when we're being very deliberate to uh, compose our scenes. Since this is going to be an underwater scene, uh, I'm going to drop a, a fish model in here uh, to give us a, uh, something to light in our scene, something to give us a sense of uh, scale, and so on. So to do that, I'm simply going to go to Window, General Editor's Content Browser, and I'm going to pick this big fish model here. Generally, I'd recommend creating your own fish or finding a more unique model, but for this example, I think this one will work just fine. Go ahead and double click on it. The fish itself comes in quite large, as you can see. So I'm going to go ahead and scale it down quite a bit. This is probably a good scale. And I'll go ahead and freeze the transforms on it. And now we have a fish in our scene to give us a little bit of a uh, sense of scale. Now, as artists, when we create environments, we only need to create the part of the environment that our viewer is going to see. And because we're controlling the camera, that gives us a lot of control um, regarding what our audience is going to see. So I'm going to go ahead and start placing the camera 
perhaps so that we can see this terrain a little easier, maybe I'll go ahead and make a uh, unique material for it. Just something that we can see a little bit more uh, easily. off of the uh, gray background there. Place our camera and we'll start constructing or uh, sculpting the terrain here. Now I'm working in the camera that I'm going to be rendering to and uh, that's going to allow me to really create the scene exactly as I want my audience to see it. Now a couple things to take note of here is that this polygon plane looks very, very plain. Uh, we can see the corners of it, we can see the edges of it, uh, which is not entirely convincing. So what I'm going to do, because I've established my camera's position, is I'm going to click on this button here. It looks like a ribbon. What that's going to do is bookmark this camera view. So by clicking on that, I just created a bookmark. Now what is a bookmark? Let's find out. Now this being my working camera, or not my working camera, sorry, this being my render camera, uh, I might accidentally move things around and then I lose my camera position. And it's going to be a bit tedious if I need to reposition it, uh, especially if I've put a lot of work into uh, carefully placing it. So what bookmarking will allow us to do then is come over here to view, bookmarks, and here is the bookmark I just created called camera view one. And if I click on that, it'll instantly pop back to that bookmark. So that's a very convenient way to make sure that you don't lose all that work that you just did in carefully placing your camera. Now that we've uh, established our camera position and we've created at least the base of what's going to be our terrain, now we can start sculpting it specifically to the camera. So in other words, by having our camera established, we can really sculpt the terrain specifically to this camera position. Now, if you want to see other techniques for creating terrain, you can watch some of my other videos. But for this example, we're going to keep it really, really simple. I'm just going to use Soft Select. So I'll select my terrain object and go to Vertex. And it appears I already have Soft Select on. But if you don't have Soft Select enabled right now, just go to your modeling toolkit soft select and you can see that it's a checkbox here. If I don't have soft select on and I grab a vertex, I get this. It moves just a single vertex. If I enable soft select, the uh, vertex that I've selected has a nice fall off to it which allows me to affect a larger area. In addition, you can change the size of your brush by holding down the B key and the left mouse button, which will allow you to make your selection either bigger or smaller. Now I'm going to use this tool to eliminate these uh, sharp corners and edges that we're seeing right now that we really don't want to see. Uh, so to do so, I'll just put some gentle terrain in here that will also help frame the scene. One thing I like to do is have some overlapping in here. I'll show you what I mean here.
Okay, so what do I mean by overlapping? What I'm talking about here is uh, these areas here where you can see I've got this uh, incline here, this little hill here with another one behind it, which gives a nice sense of uh, depth in my terrain. So it adds a little bit of depth in the terrain because we've got overlapping, which is just a really important visual cue to indicate that something is in front of something else and that there is this sense of depth in our environment. So I spent just a few more moments uh, sculpting my terrain here. Nothing uh, too fancy, nothing too over the top here. Pretty simple, uh, but definitely adequate for this uh, example here. So now that we have our seafloor, our terrain, let's go ahead and create a light. So I'm going to go ahead and choose one of my viewports here. We'll go ahead and create a light. Maybe a spotlight's not the best light for this example, but because it's such an easy light to use, that's what I'm going to use for this example. But uh, a directional light or an area light could potentially work for the techniques that I'm going to be showing you. I'll go ahead and choose a spotlight though and I'll choose one of my viewports and I will look through that spotlight and go ahead and place it. Now because I'm using a spotlight I'm going to make sure that I pull the spotlight back far enough so that I'm getting all of my terrain here. I'm going to try that position and in my render camera I'll press 7 so that we can see the light actually being used and I'll go ahead and enable in my viewport under lighting I'll enable shadows so that we can better position our light and actually get the shadows as we want them. I'm going to do something like this I think where the light is definitely it's coming from an angle but uh, still coming from uh, very much from above. Maybe I'll move my fish up a little bit like that and that should be good for now. Let's go ahead and do a render of this. I want to point out something to you. We can see the shadow here. I'm going to go ahead and hit my render button and what you'll notice is that we have no shadow in our render view. That's because we're using Maya software render not the Arnold render. So I'll open up my outliner, select my spotlight, open up the attribute editor and I'll come over to shadows and I'm going to tell it to use depth map shadows. Now when we render this out you will notice that we have our shadow in our scene. Now another thing you might notice is that the resolution of the shadow isn't really all that nice. Uh, that has to do with the resolution here as well as the filter size here. Notice that right now the resolution is set to 512. If I were to reduce that to 64 as an example and render that out you'll notice that our shadow becomes even more pixelated. If I increase that resolution to 1024 then we get sharper shadows and we can also adjust the filter size here if we want to soften those up a little bit and in fact by increasing the filter size we could even bring the resolution number back down. By using the resolution and the filter size you can get a lot of control of with uh, how crisp your shadows are. If you want them softened or if you want them really crisp adjusting these two values will allow you to do that. Now, one thing we could do is maybe something a little nicer for this uh, ground texture on here. Right now we just have a solid color on it. It's going to be sand, and this is a pretty nice color for sand. We could find a tileable sand texture or create a tileable sand texture in something like Photoshop. Uh, but what I'm going to do here is actually uh, create a procedural uh, shader, a procedural texture that my shader will use to uh, create that sand texture that I want. So I'll go ahead and go to my hypershade 
I'll create a new Lambert here. Let me go ahead and name that Lambert. We'll name it Sand Mat. And I'll go ahead and apply it to my terrain object. And we'll go ahead and start adjusting it. So remember that you can change the color of it or we can apply a texture. If I click on the checkerboard, I could click File if I have an image of sand, or instead, I could use one of these other 2D textures, these procedural textures, such as uh, noise. Noise might work nicely for creating some sand. We'll go ahead and apply that. We're not seeing it applied to the train yet, but that is because we need to press 6 on our keyboard, and there it is. Not very convincing. Uh, for sand, but a couple things I'll just point out to you. We've got a couple different noise types that we can apply. Right now it's set to billow. Uh, notice that we've got Perlin noise, wave, wispy, and space time. We'll go ahead and keep it on billow for the time being. I'm going to go down to the color balance and I'm going to change the color gain and offset to give it a nice sand color. Something like that I think can work. And we'll come back up here and play around with some of the properties of this procedural noise texture. Let's take a look at some of the different parameters. We've got threshold, amplitude, ratio. You can see what these all do. I recommend playing around with them to see what they're doing. Uh, frequency ratio. Frequency, depending on how fine we want the sand to look. Uh, as well as a bunch of other properties that you can uh, that you can play with. Let's go ahead and just really quickly just see what some of these other noise types look like. I know we looked at them a little bit earlier, but we'll just take another look and see if any of them work a little nicer. Uh, I think either space time or uh, or the billow. Maybe I'll go ahead and stick with space time for this. I think that's looking pretty good. We'll go ahead and leave it at that. Another thing that we could do is apply a bump map to our uh, ground texture. Uh, that might give it a little bit more uh, variation. Let's go ahead and give that a try. I'm going to use another procedural texture for that as well. So I'll go ahead and make sure I have my sand texture selected. Go to bump mapping. Once again, we'll pick one of the 2D uh, procedural shaders. I think this time I'm going to pick ramp. This can be a little bit difficult to work with because we're not really seeing it very well. It's kind of hard to see what we're doing uh, when we start working with this map. So to make it a little bit more obvious, I'm going to go ahead and pick my sand texture, look at the up and downstream connections, and I'm going to temporarily break that color channel. Here's how I'm going to do that. I'm going to, here you can see my network, my shader network, and this is, let me just move this up here so that you can see this a little bit better and understand what's going on here. This is my shader network. Here's my sand material. And in to the color channel is that noise that I created to create the color of the sand. And then here is the ramp that I'm using for the bump map. I'm going to apply the bump map as the color channel so that we can see it a little bit better while we work on it and then we'll go ahead and connect it as a bump map in a moment. So let's take a look. To break the channel, the uh, color channel, I'm going to just drag this connector off of there and I'm going to take the color channel of my ramp and apply it to 
sorry, well, yeah, the out color. I'm going to apply it to the color of my sand mat. And then here it is applied. It doesn't look like much right now, but let's go ahead and choose or select my ramp and make some adjustments to it. So we can add more colors into our ramp, something like that. We can adjust the V wave if we want. We can increase noise on it as well as noise frequency. And perhaps that will work for our bump map. Let's go ahead and give that a try. We'll go ahead and reconnect the um, different channels that we were working with here. So instead of using our ramp now as the color channel, we'll go ahead and break that. Here's our bump map being applied without the color on there. I think I'm going to tone that down a little by selecting the bump node, the bump 2D node here, and we'll just reduce the uh, bump depth on it, something like that, something a little more subtle. And we'll go ahead and reapply our noise sand to the color channel like that. And there we go. Now we're using both a color map and a uh, bump map on the texture on our terrain. Let's go ahead and uh, press 7 on the keyboard as well, just to make sure that we're actually using our light that we have in our scene. And that way we have our cast shadows. And we can go ahead and render this out and see how it looks. Kind of losing that bump map a little bit here. Maybe we need to increase it. Uh, we start to see it a little bit more there. Might need to do some further adjustment to it a little later. Uh, but for the time being, uh, we'll go ahead and move on. So in a moment, we'll go ahead and start trying to create the caustic effect. But I think that before I do that, I'm going to change my background so that it's not this black. Now, you're already aware, I'm sure, that you can find an image uh, that you can use as an image plane in here to create that background. Uh, but I'm going to keep it very simple. I'm simply going to use another gradient for the background. And here is how I'm going to do that. I'm going to go ahead and select my camera, because that's the camera I'll be rendering to. In the attribute editor, editor we'll go to environment, and I'm going to create an image plane. And this is where I would normally go to apply an image by clicking on the folder and picking image, well, under image name, click on the folder, find the image that you want to apply. Uh, but instead of using an image, I'm going to go ahead and change the image type here to texture. And then I'm going to come down here to where it says texture, click on the checkerboard here, and as I said, I'm going to simply use another gradient. And perhaps so that you can see this a little bit better, let's just see what's going on here. I'm going to change the colors of my gradient. It's not going to exactly look like an underwater scene here, but that's okay. We'll fix that in a moment. So here's what we've got. Let's go ahead and render it out. And as you can see, it's using that gradient. We're not seeing the red or the yellow because it's uh, further down here. So let's go ahead and change these colors to something a little more like water. Make a nice dark color a nice dark blue, and then we'll take uh, have an, a lighter blue kind of up at the top, something like this perhaps, and we'll go ahead and render that out. There we go. I'd like to see a little bit more of this dark area of this gradient, so I'm going to take 
this handle and I'm just going to drag it over to the right. And there we go, there's our background. And for the time being, I think I'll leave it at that. So let's go ahead and start creating our caustic effect. Now, uh, I'll save this image so that we can compare it to uh, an image that we'll be making in a moment. Remember that we took a look at these two images here. The caustics, and then we also took a look at this example of actual real-world caustics in a swimming pool. We're going to try using this, uh, this image here uh, as our caustic effect by attaching it to our light. Okay, So let's see what happens when we do that. Let me go ahead and close that and return to Maya. We already created a light, so I will select that light. And under the color, uh, this could be a convenient place to maybe change the color, for instance, uh, but that's not what we're going to do. We could give it a blue tint, which could be kind of nice, make it feel a little bit more like it's underwater, right? Uh, but what we're actually going to try to do is apply that caustics image to the color channel. So I'll go to Color, click on the checkerboard, go to File, click on the folder, select the caustics image and apply. Now you're not going to see any difference in here in our viewport, but when I render it, you'll see that it's actually using that image uh, for the light. Okay. Now the problem with this, of course, is that it's not going to be very convincing because it's going to be static. It's not going to be moving because it's simply an image. So we want to do something a little bit different uh, to create our animated caustic effect. And to do that, we're going to be using some more procedural 2D textures. Okay, let's go ahead and get started. I think for the time being, I am actually going to hide my terrain. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and freeze the transforms on it as well. Uh, Right now you can see I've got the scale information on it and some of the things I might be doing later on with the terrain, uh, it'll probably work better if I freeze the transforms on it. So let me go ahead and go to modify, freeze transformations. Maybe I'll go ahead and delete history on it as well. And we'll go ahead and for the time being hide it. And I'm going to create another polygon plane Because the first thing we're going to do is just create a material so that we can really see what we're doing. As you recall, when I applied the caustics image to my light, we actually didn't see it in the viewport here. So we really do need to be able to see something as we're working on it to be able to get the desired effect uh, without having to render it multiple times uh, as we tweak the various parameters for, for this caustic effect. So I'm going to go ahead and create another material. And I'll apply that material to my uh, plane that I just created. I'm going to go ahead and call this caustics mat. And I'll go to the color channel of this material and to 2D textures. Now, you could try a number of 2D textures to get this effect. Uh, the simplex noise might work. The noise uh, one could be a good one as well. Uh, I've already played around a little bit with this fractal and it seemed to work really well. So I think I'm going to use that one for this example. I'll go ahead and apply that. And We'll go ahead and take a look at its up and downstream connections. It's a pretty simple material at this point. I'll select the fractal node here and open up its attribute editor. Uh, you can see what it looks like right now. Nothing special, 
but we'll go ahead and start playing around once again with these various parameters over here in the attribute editor to get something that looks a little bit more like caustics. So uh, with the fractal node or texture on my material selected and open in my graph editor, we'll go ahead and adjust these different parameters. Uh, you should definitely experiment a little bit with them and see what they actually do. Uh, here's amplitude, threshold, uh, some of the ones that I think we're going to need here will be the ratio and frequency ratio. Uh, so you can see I can soften and, and harden them using that. We can also adjust the frequency ratio. Something that like that starts to look a little bit better. Uh, I'm also going to check inflection. Uh, once I check that, it looks like I'm going to need to adjust these a little bit more. Uh, but as you can see, uh, this starts to look nice. This starts to look a little bit more like caustics. Notice that I actually brought the ratio down to zero and my frequency uh, ratio is also uh, scrubbed to the left quite a bit. So here we go. The beginning of our caustics here. Now, I'm going to go ahead and go to color balance, and we can start working on the color gain and color offset for this. Uh, we can pick some nice blues for that. And uh, I'm also going to go to effects, and I'm going to invert it because I actually want these kind of lines here that I've created, I want those to be the light uh, part of my caustics effect. At this point now it's just a little bit of fine tuning. And it's looking pretty good. For the time being, I think I'll leave it at that. Now, right now, remember, this is just a texture, so it's not going to affect the light at all. This is just a regular material and a texture. Uh, and on top of that, if I hit play, nothing is animated. But if I check the animated checkbox, then what I can do is use time here to cause uh, the effect to be animated over time. Now, I'm going to set some keys on this. I'll set a key on frame one. And because I think I'm going to want this to be a longer animation than 120 frames, I'm going to go ahead and increase this to 600 frames. Scrub to the end here. Let's make sure I actually got that keyed on time. We'll set that. We'll go ahead and scrub this. I'm going to bring it all the way to the right, but I think that's going to be too fast. And we'll go ahead and key that as well. And now when I scrub through here, you can see it's actually animated. If I hit play, it's quite fast. In addition, it also has a slow in and slow out at the beginning of the animation. So. We'll fix that right now. So I did make a few uh, quick little adjustments to the colors. Uh, probably want to fine tune it a little bit more a little later, but uh, it's just it's an iterative process. Uh, what we want to do, of course, is slow down this animation here. Right now it's just uh, changing too much. I have it going from zero in time all the way to 100. Uh, we could try changing that time at the end, maybe to, we'll, we'll bring it down considerably and try 10. It's not letting me change it, just so you know. I'm typing the value in here and it's actually not letting me change it uh, manually. I could take the, the slider here, I suppose, and just bring it over there to about 10. Oh, it's still not letting me do it. 
No problem. Here's what we'll do. We'll go to the graph editor. We needed to go there anyway, so not a big deal. This is the animation curve. This is the animation curve that I have animated. It is this time value here. I'm going to first of all select the animation curve, make it linear so that we don't have that slow out and that slow in. And I'm going to go ahead and take that value uh, where it went all the way to 100 and I'm simply going to make that 10. And that should slow down the effect quite a bit. Maybe it's still a little too much. Let's go ahead and bring it down a little bit more. I could even just grab the value and move it. You see it updates in here as I do that. I'm holding down shift to lock it into uh, one axis. Now it's about a value of six or so, I think. And that looks pretty good. I think I like that. So uh, I think that will be good for this uh, caustic effect. So now that we've created our fractal texture that we're going to use in our light, uh, I think I will go ahead and hide this plane. I won't delete it because, oh, if I want to make adjustments to the texture later on, I can always uh, work on it a little bit more looking at this polygon plane. But we'll go ahead and hide it if it'll let me. Okay. Uh, and I will select my terrain. In fact, I'm going to name it terrain so it's a little bit more obvious if it allows me to change the name. Maya is being very temperamental. Okay. Uh, let's go ahead and make it visible again. There it is. Okay. Now, as you can see, uh, right now we just have this regular light on here. Actually, we don't have regular light on there. We applied that image, if you remember, earlier. So this is still the image that's being applied to the light. We'll go ahead and select the light. Open up its attribute editor. Go to its shape node. And under color, we're going to break that connection. If we render this out, you'll see it'll just be the regular spotlight now. And we're going to apply that new texture that I just created to the color channel of my light. Easiest way to do that, I could click on the checkerboard here and, and apply it that way, but I think it's actually easier to open up the hypershade go to your textures tab, find the appropriate texture. In this case, it's this one here, my fractal texture. And I'm going to middle mouse drag it into the color channel of my light. Now we don't see anything different here, but if I render it out, we should have a nice caustic effect in our scene here. So, what we actually want to see now is this caustic effect animated. So what I'm going to do is actually render out some of the animation. Now we've got 600 frames and that's quite a few uh, frames to animate. That's going to take a long time. So I think I'm going to just render out maybe oh, two seconds of the animation or 48 frames. Uh, that should be enough to determine whether this is looking as we intend or not. I'll go to my render settings and we're going to render it out as an AVI. I'll go ahead and name it. Call it Caustics Test. I'm going to go to my Maya software and make sure that's production quality. Uh, right now it is set to render out frames 1 through 10. I'll change that to 48. That'll be two seconds. I'm going to select my renderable camera. Right now it's set to perspective camera, but we're going to go to the drop down and select my camera. And that should be good. Make sure that you know where you're saving your renders. In this case, you'll find the path right here 
in the render settings. In this case, I have a project called Caustics, and it's going to save it into the images folder of my project. So let's go ahead and close that and go ahead and create our render now. To create the render, I'll go to this drop down, select rendering, go to render, batch render, and we'll go ahead and let it do its thing. It'll take just a few moments. Okay, my render has completed. It did take a few moments, but I can see down here it says rendering completed. See my render log text for information. So I'm going to go ahead and go to where my render has saved. Here it is, and we'll open it up and take a quick look at it. And there it is. And the caustics are looking pretty good. Uh, but the image overall is darker than I was expecting. And let's take a look at why that's the case. So I'll go ahead and close that. We'll go ahead and return to Maya and just talk a little bit about that. Now, if I render this out, you'll notice that it in fact comes a lot lighter than what our video render came as. And you probably will remember that when you render out still images, you typically go to File, Save Image, and you make sure that Color Managed Image is checked. But that is specifically for your still images, and this is a video. So what we're going to do is take a look at what this image would look like as a raw image instead. I'm going to go to this drop down and select raw and you can see that it comes considerably darker uh, more or less it looks like what our video render looked like so I think I'll leave it on this raw setting here as we adjust and try to get something uh, that looks a little bit brighter another thing I would like to do is actually create an ambient light in here and I'll tell you why uh, let me go ahead and go to create lights ambient light. An ambient light is just a quick and simple uh, way of roughly simulating what bounced light in our environment might look like. You notice that all the shadows were very dark. This will lighten things up a little bit. Uh, if we render it out, we should see that in fact it does look lighter, uh, maybe a little too light. So I'll bring my ambient light down a little, maybe 50%, and maybe I'll even give it a slight warm color, as if it's light bouncing off of the uh, sandy surface here. Go ahead and render that out. Maybe brighten it up a little bit. And for the time being, I think that should suffice. So let's go ahead and try doing another render. Uh, a couple things you'll notice with that ambient light, it does kind of light up some of this area that before was in complete shadow. Uh, and it makes it look a little bit like light is bouncing off of this uh, terrain here and maybe uh, bounce light is lighting up the under surface of our fish here. Okay, let's go ahead and give this a try. So I'm simply going to render it again. Uh, I can save over my old render, so I don't need to change any of the render settings right now. This is going to be just another test render of two seconds. So let's give that a try. My test render has completed. Let's go ahead and take a look at it. I'll open it up. And here it is. And that's looking pretty good. I'm liking the caustic effects uh, that we've created here. So that'll pretty much do it for this video. In future videos, we'll take a look at how we can populate this scene with more objects such as plants and rocks and 
uh, other objects. Uh, we'll also take a look at depth of field and I will show you an easy way to animate the fish swimming in this environment. So I'll see you in the next videos.